and then then it's under start share yes desktop very good participants can now see your screen can they i can yes okay here we go uh i'd like to talk about storytelling in or interactive storytelling in terms of two models two idealized way of thinking about the structure of games and story worlds and i call them the oak tree model and the palm tree model and the oh this is just great um can i get this any bigger yeah there we go these are the theoretical manifestation, the, the purest expressions of these two models. The oak tree model is just a simple expanding tree. And the palm tree model is what I use with Le Mort d'Artur, which is basically a linear story with branching only at the very end. And I'm going to present the thesis that Fundamentally, the palm tree model is really the only way to go with interactive storytelling. However, both of these models have endless variations on them and modifications and compromises. We never achieve these two theoretically pure models. So any real story world will be based on the palm tree model, but will not necessarily, will not look exactly like this. In fact, Le Mort d'Artur doesn't look like this. It has some uh, subtrees built into it at various places. So, okay. Now, the problem with the palm tree model in terms of games has to do with the learning curve. Uh, God, there's been so many discussions of learning curves for games in books the Game Developers Conference, it seems like every year there's a lecture on learning curves. Um, the idea being that the learning curve, this is the theoretically ideal learning curve, that basically a smooth, straight line uh, so that the difficulty at the end is much greater than the difficulty at the beginning, but presumably the player has learned, so you're teaching them. And there are all sorts of bad learning curves with big steps at some points. And that's generally, game designers say, no, 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 don't ever have those big steps. However, there's an important point that I think you especially will appreciate. And that is that the challenge that the player experiences in playing a game is the first time derivative of the difficulty. In other words, uh, it's the rate of change of difficulty that presents the challenge. Once you've gotten, say, halfway there, your the the challenge uh, is uh, the absolute challenge is greater, but the challenge relative to your state of learning is the same. So this is the ideal result. Now, of course, if the slope of the difficulty is lower, then the challenge is lower. So uh, just an interesting relationship there between absolute difficulty and relative challenge. So let's see. Let's talk about this in terms of the very first Star Wars. Boy, that poster didn't really do a good job, did it? Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, let me imagine an alternate universe, uh, a game design universe in which everything is present is thought of in terms of uh, uh, you know game concepts, and so. You know, Socrates in, in the Fido is talking about whether you're winning or losing by taking the poison. And, you know, Jesus Christ doesn't say, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, you know, the best way to win this game is to be a nice guy. Uh, so in this alternate universe, the Star Wars movie goes through all of the initial stuff 
And things really start when Luke is having a conversation with his first conversation with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, and Obi-Wan gives him the, uh, uh, the lightsaber. Only this time, Obi-Wan uh, says, you know, there's a big womp rat down the ravine about 100, year, 100 yards from here. And he ate my dog the other day. Why don't you take your lightsaber and go down and kill that womp rat for me? And so Luke goes down and fights the womp rat, has a big exciting fight, kills the womp rat, comes back, and Obi-Wan says, very good, Luke. Now, what do you say we go uh, to Mos Eisley Spaceport? And so they go off to Mos Eisley Spaceport, and they run into the uh, checkpoint manned by the Imperial uh, Stormtroopers. And uh, Obi-Wan says, Luke, Will you get rid of these guys for me with your lightsaber? And so Luke whips out his lightsaber and and slays the stormtroopers. And then the, and Obi Wan says, "Good boy, Luke, that was very good." And so then they go to the cantina where a uh, uh, bully tries to pick a fight with Luke, and Luke looks at Obi Wan, and Obi Wan kind of neat winks and nods. And Luke pulls out his uh, lightsaber and kills the bully. So anyway, then they uh, the story goes on and on like this. And uh, throughout the whole thing, uh, uh, Luke keeps getting to use his lightsaber in these fights. And uh, on each of these fights, he if he dies, that's the end of the movie, but in this movie he manages to succeed in every case until the uh, 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 until he finally blows up the Death Star. So it's just one one damn thing after another, and that's the way the Star Wars movie would have been done in this alternate universe. It would have been a gamey movie, and it would have been a really lousy story. Uh, and that's the problem uh, that we're having with games. That's that's why games really are not prepared to be good, uh, uh, a good basis for interactive storytelling, and why I am confident that we will never see interact interactive storytelling evolve out of games. Uh, you know, they might evolve out of something else, but certainly not games. Uh, however, there is an exception I'll mention. Strategy games uh, do at least provide... See, the problem with the regular games is that they provide this... This uh, They require instant feedback. You've got to, you know, do your thing and then get evaluated. And, oh, I did this and that was good. And I did that and I got the, the, the uh, funny lightsaber, so forth. Um, and in fact, if you look, uh, actually just the feedback in a conventional game is pretty much linear. That is every step of the way you're getting this feedback, um, which is all very useful and keeps reassuring you. Yeah, you're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing a good job or oops, you lost. Try again. But in the case of civilization, Typically, the way you play is, or at least the way I play, is to play a bit, keep my head down for most of the game. I don't get in big wars because I'm not really ready. Um, I spend most of the game building up my capabilities and not getting any feedback on whether I'm doing a good job. And then late in the game, then I get into the conflict and then I start fighting wars. And that's how I went. So there's there's a, a lot of deferred uh, gratification in required in a strategy game. Uh, so yes, these types of things do better fit the model for storytelling. So uh, let me shift gears now and talk about a different way of thinking about the evolution of a story. I took the uh, I took the Star Wars, first Star Wars movie, and I broke it down into 
chunks, scenes, whatever, uh, representing the entire movie in what, about 30 steps. And uh, for each one, I, uh, I uh, assessed the scene in terms of four variables, danger, happiness, mystery, and sadness. Uh, danger is obvious, you know, are they being shot at or chased or, or are bad things happening? Happiness is whether the, uh, you know, what's happening makes you feel good. Mystery is whether the experience is raising all sorts of questions in your mind. Okay, well, why are they doing this and so forth? And then sadness is just the uh, inverse of the happiness. So, and then I just plopped these numbers down. I did not take a lot of time researching it. I just kind of made it up as I was going along. And let me show you the, res the graph of the results. Here's, uh, here's the whole thing uh, of the evolution of these things over time. Let me break them, make it a little easier to read this. Here's the danger value. And you can see it proceeds in fairly even chunks, um, uh, that is, it, it tends to be spaced out. Uh, not a lot of danger at first, but then it builds and builds, and then finally you have the, the big battle. Um, the happiness starts off basically at zero for the first half of the movie. There really isn't anything interesting happening or happy happening. But then various events do take place. But the real thing is right at the end over here when he's blown up the Death Star and the pretty girl gives him a medal and uh, hooray, you know, the great music and so forth. So uh, uh, good for you, Luke. So that's the happiness. Uh, the sadness, though, is interspersed. It tends to be uh, more in the uh, 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 in the earlier stages. Uh, this peak here is when he finds that his aunt and uncle are dead. This is when Obi Wan is killed. Um, but and this is the battle where some of his friends are killed. But uh, in general, again, this is spaced out, and this is a very important point. A story is kind of like a roller coaster in that you can't have the same feeling just continuing. You've got to br bring out that feeling and then go away, do something else. Uh, and then uh, here's the mystery. And the interesting thing about this is that obviously at the beginning of the movie, there are a lot of things going on and you're wondering, well, why is this happening? And But then it tends to reduce later on and by the end it's resolved you understand this is why all these things happened so a theoretical theoretically pure mystery thing would be an oscillating thing that's declining in overall in average intensity and so uh my conclusion oh dear this doesn't want to expand is that the oak tree model requires a short attention span because you're getting constant feedback. Okay, let's let Chris in. And uh, the palm tree model uh, requires a long attention span. And then, of course, the oak tree model uh, provides more fun, uh, but the palm tree model is more appropriate to a story. Uh and that's the end. <laughs> Chris, hi. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I'll quickly summarize. Um, we've been, in fact, I think I can dump this now and go back to, uh, here we go, stop, share. There we go. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Uh, daylight saving time, uh, gotcha. Uh, no, I was just coming back from a place where I volunteer. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, uh, the, uh, 
uh, I'll summarize. There are two basic, or I present in this two basic models. They're theoretical constructs that are not meant to realistically represent the design of either games or story worlds, but they do present nice theoretical structures, kind of like Newtonian mechanics, trying to describe how cars drive down the road. Uh, and it is, yeah, at a fundamental level, it is illuminating. And the two models are the oak tree model, which is just a big expanding tree with where, oh, this point I failed to make earlier. In the oak tree model, the player's decisions determine what new states the player uh, gets to. That is, the player's decisions navigate through the tree. Uh, the alternative model is the palm tree model, which is basically a straight line that branches only at the very end. Uh, Lamort d'Artour has this. Um, and in the palm tree model, the player's decisions alter the values of global variables that determine this final outcome. Now, of course, lots of games have global variables that are changed by the player's decisions. And in fact, Lamour d'Artour has a few, uh, a few branching trees in it. So th these theoretical models are only ways of thinking about the uh, design rather than actual working models. Uh, this is the kind of thing physicists do all the time. Everything in physics is like these ideal models. And uh, if you actually want to talk about reality, the answer is always, uh, that's an engineering problem. Uh, so anyway. Uh, yeah, the same with I can delete everything's models. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, the central point I wanted to make, though, was that stories uh, are structured in such a way that the tree model just isn't going to work. Uh, you really do have to go with the palm tree model. Uh, I, I can give a few little examples, as in, oh, gee, that's really too bad about Juliet, but oh, well, there are other fish in the sea. No, that is not Romeo's option. Uh, and uh, Juliet doesn't have a, the option of, who is this nitwit climbing up to my window? Come on, get lost, loser. You know, that's not an option for her either. Um, over and over, you look at great stories. And in fact, people have been trying to do this for decades. Let's take a great story like you know uh, uh tom sawyer or uh the iliad uh, you know macbeth whatever and we'll interactivize it by giving the player choices where you know single events happened in the story and the choices always suck uh people really try to come up with intelligent believable alternatives but those always lead to dead ends or they end up having to branch back without having much real effect or that 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 approach just doesn't work so uh you get people to paint the fence yes or no you know <laughs> yes yes <laughs> uh, there's so many ridiculous uh i had fun with that did i do that with you guys the uh Oh, yes. Yeah. Someone, I think that was on Facebook, where somebody had suggested, gee, Chris, why don't you do a sequel to Le Morte d'Artour? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. How about uh, these sequels? Uh, the Titanic. Uh, Titanic 2. Uh, <laughs> what's his name? Learns to swim. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front uh, 2. Yeah, yeah, you missed me. Uh <laughs> And, and, and sorry, you, there's some stories you just don't do sequels for. So uh, anyway, the uh, again, there's so many strong requirements on stories that uh, the oak tree model just doesn't work. Um, oh, there was another little side point I wanted to make about that. Oh, yes. 
this isn't a side point. It's, well, I don't know, a completely different point. Um, story literacy has been increasing dramatically in the last uh, 180 years or so. I'll put the start with Dickens. Um, that is right up until we we really had a number of phases in uh storytelling literacy in the public uh first phase was oral storytelling that had the standard image of the jongleur the the traveling storyteller all storytelling was done by professionals who memorized these long long stories and uh, then they would travel from place to place. And the basic deal was uh, you put me up, you know, room and board for a few nights or a week, and I'll tell stories every night to entertain you. And that's how these guys worked. And uh, they made a living that way. And they carried on these traditions of the stories. And interestingly, the stories evolved in this way. I'm not sure if I told you, there's a wonderful book. Uh, an American researcher went to Yugoslavia in the 1930s, where there were still some of these, oh, bard is another term, troubadour. Well, they were more music uh, musicians, but um, they still had these people going around in Yugoslavia. And so he tracked them down and studied them and basically nailed down the procedure. Uh, it was actually a combination of, yes, remembering the story in general, but also remembering the particular phrasings. And uh, uh, all these guys had these uh, uh, standardized phrases they used that had particular meters. And so they could they were being creative in two ways. One, they'd modify the story. They were, in effect, over the course of centuries, they tuned up the stories. They deleted some of the dull parts and threw in more interesting parts. And at the tactical level, they got better and better at developing standard phrases with standard meters that could be plugged in to, to make it easier to recite the whole thing. And this shows up easily in Homer, where you get these standard phrases popping up that, you know, the wine dark sea and uh, rosy fingered dawn and uh, owl eyed Athena. Uh, there's a, I once looked at the list. There's a long, long list of these phrases. Anyway, uh, this was the way storytelling was done. Uh, in Europe, right up to about uh, Gutenberg. Um, he put those people pretty much out of business. It took about 100 years. But uh, the advent of writing, and in fact, I mean, Homer had been running around. I mean, uh, I mean those stories had started long, long before, and Homer just wrote them down, probably around... 700 BCE in the same way the Arthurian legends god they re they started off about at least 4000 years ago we're, we're pretty sure of that and then they just evolved and evolved and they they modified so uh i think one of the scholars established that the before arthur was the protagonist it was k uh, K was the big shot. He did all sorts of research and figured out that K was the the leading protagonist. And then when the Britons fought against the uh, invading Anglo-Saxons and they fled to Brittany, uh, Arthur became the protagonist. But K, he was the brother of K, see, and that's how they were able to evolve. Um, and then the French had to put Lancelot in. Hey, we're going to have a French hero here. Um, and so they evolved and evolved. And really, it wasn't written down until uh, uh, Mallory, 1480 or so. So, But Gutenberg 
began the shift to the second phase of storytelling literacy where the stories were printed. Uh, although Shakespeare played, this is weird. That what Actually, it was sort of an intermediate where the plays were printed, but then theater companies uh, e executed the plays. They actually implemented them. And so you had sort of a combination of the printing and the acting and so forth. And so that's why plays became, theater became a dominant, uh, became so important from about 1600 to about 1900. Um, but by early 19th century, uh, they'd gotten good at bringing down the cost of books. Until then, books were still pretty expensive and only fairly wealthy people or upper middle class could afford them. But then Dickens came along and at the same time they had uh, cheap uh, printing. And so all of a sudden, you know, the yokels were reading stories and zillions of people uh, were reading these stories. And this actually had a double effect. On the one hand, it vastly increased literacy rates. And this went along with public schooling, which also became standard uh, around 1850. And, uh, and a real audience for authors. That is, you know, people could make money by making stories. Uh, Jane Austen, I mean, the you read about great authors and it really starts around 1820 or so. Uh, so uh, that early period, 1820 to about 1860, is when we see the rise of this kind of author. And uh, it just keeps growing and growing with authors like Mark Twain and Robert Louis Stevenson and so forth. Um and so we had a jump in storytelling literacy and that had the effect of making stories less episodic, that is requiring longer attention spans. That is most stories, uh, certainly all the stories that the uh, bards told were just episodic. They were kind of like uh, uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Every episode is independent of the others. And it was pretty much the same way with the oral stories. Um, uh, and even with a lot of the early printed stories. Uh, but we started seeing longer, you know, longer attention spans required by people like uh, Jane Austen and, you know, all of these early 19th century authors uh, where you had to read through the whole book to get to the, you know, the fun part or the end or whatever. Uh, they were less episodic. We were seeing an evolution from Star Trek The Next Generation to Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which was a long, long single story with lots of episodes. Um, and that process continued in literature and certainly storytelling nowadays, when you look at uh, novels, <laughs> there's much more uh, uh, the threads connecting the whole story. They're more tightly integrated and you have to pay more attention and you need a greater literacy, that as storytelling literacy, not reading literacy, but understanding how stories work so that things that happen early in the story, you know, you, you keep track of them and you realize, oh, this applied to that. Uh, one common feature that shows up in a lot of these stories is uh, a little item that was just mentioned once early on. Suddenly it becomes really important later on. Um, and then uh, cinema has followed a very similar course, started off short, and that was 
initially a technical issue, but <laughs> um, for various reasons, they settled on about 90 to 120 minutes is sort of the standard for a movie, uh, <laughs> which I think really says more about the uh, structural integrity of the gluteus maximus and the human body. Um, because the, I mean, you're just sitting there for the whole thing. Um, but even so, even so, we're seeing more and more extended stories. That is, uh, most movies from the, oh, the 20s all the way up until the 90s were either, uh, were, were basically one shot deals. We didn't have that many sequels. Uh, we did have episodic movies like the Superman movies, Flash Gordon, that kind of thing. But uh, those were pretty much independent of each other. But one of the really interesting developments starting around 1980 or so was the development of longer uh, uh, connected, integrated storytelling based on episodes. In fact, I'll give a beautiful example of this. Kathy and I are just now watching, finishing up a series of episodes, I'm pretty sure done by BBC, uh, on Netflix called Bodies. Uh, very strange story. Have either of you seen it? It's it's no, quite sorry. new. Um, I won't give away anything, but it has eight episodes and it's very confusing at first um, because it there are actually four stories going on at once. One taking place in 1890, another in 1941, a third in 2023, and a fourth in 2053. But they're all connected. And at first you're jumping around, boing, 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 and wait a minute, what does this have to do with that? And slowly the pieces come together. It's really quite impressive how over eight episodes, they slowly integrate them. And uh, tonight we watch the last episode where the pieces all come together. Uh, but we can see this process. This is eight, an eight our story uh if i mean can you imagine anybody in cinema saying hey let's do an eight hour movie we'll just break it up in eight parts uh that concept was was impossible i mean just unthinkable but well, th fact, think about the dune movie where they got the first part and now we're going to see the second part <laughs> yep yep uh, and in fact, uh, the, uh, um, come on, the uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the, come on, movies with Neo in them. Uh, oh, the Matrix oh, ones, yeah. Yeah, Matrix, one, two, and three. Uh, w there does, Hollywood has settled on a three-movie standard for its episodic movies, and, you know, Star Wars, Episodes four, five, and six. Oh, uh, wait. Four, then five, then six at a roughly two-hour uh, intervals. And then we wait 20 hours, 20 years, and one, two, and three. And now we got a million of them jumping all over the place. <laughs> Star Trek, same thing. Initially purely episodic. And then this radical experiment with Deep Space Nine, which at first was considered a failure i mean a lot of trekkies hated it uh but uh, interestingly deep space nine is growing its reputation is steadily increasing uh which i think reflects increasing uh story literacy so so i don't know we've 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 had a very interesting phenomenon here with the development of storytelling because the quantity of story consumed by the average American, in fact, by people all over the world, is dramatically rising. Uh, I mean, we, 
we see. And, and another aspect of this are the micro stories, which are what we see on uh, uh, Instagram, uh, the little short video, TikTok. Uh, there are a whole bunch of those. There's <laughs> uh, on Facebook, there's a Darwin Awards group where you get these little micro stories of, oh, look, here's a motorcyclist. Oh, he's going too fast. Oh, oh, that brick wall. Goodbye, bye, motorcyclist. Um, so we're seeing story consumption exploding. Uh, what that means, I do not know. Or where that will go, I have no idea. But anyway, reactions, thoughts? It is it is kind of interesting because I I follow a few authors and one of the things that one of them was talking about was trying to make a, a self contained story that didn't suddenly become a series, um, <laughs> which unfortunately a lot of publishers I mean because they like money uh, will conceive various different series and so you'll never really get that that finishing point yeah and a little little dips here and there of. You know, oh, well, this story ended, but there's still more and wait for the second book, which is also frustrating whenever you go to a Barnes and Noble and you find uh, episodes four and 12 of a series only <laughs> yeah. that are constantly in stock and not, none of the rest. But I digress. Well, that, that, that raises an interesting point in that people expect the sequels. OK, yeah, that was a good story. Give me more. Uh, more of the same. Uh, certainly, we now have the idea of a of a, a world created by an author, and if his first book is uh, successful, then we'll do some some more along the same lines. Uh, the author, I don't know how her name is pronounced, A U E L, who did the uh, Neanderthal uh, stories. Uh, uh, clan of the cave bear and then there were more and you know i i don't know if if she'd listened to the publishers we'd probably be up to uh, the dark ages by now so uh anyway uh this is all very interesting stuff it is like everything else in modern civilization the pace is accelerating um I don't know. They, we're just seeing uh, faster and faster change. Certainly the uh, stories that young people prefer. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I am. It is certain. The comic book movies, the great success of these comic book movies is certainly a depressing development. Um, there is so little. uh the uh oh yeah oh how many sequels were there more than i was aware of because I, I think my mom had the clan of the cave bear i saw it on her bookshelves and then there's like the valley of horses continues the story which further uh develops into earth's children which i never saw mammoth hunters the plains of passage the shelters of stone and finally <laughs> the land of painted caves <laughs> yeah you know, it's kind of like a little house on the prairie it's like how many of them did there need to be yeah. um but yeah well, the uh, uh, young people today, of course, th their storytelling tastes are very different from mine. Um, and I, I'm sure that reflects to some extent the evolution of storytelling literacy. Um, and I don't know what to think about that um well back to the comic book movies it it reflects the the art form that it comes from every month there's a new issue of a, of the comic book every month you're moving the story along in some fashion now generally speaking it's not necessarily going to be a satisfying conclusion it's going to be a, a soap opera where you get you know little things here and there and oh by the way tune in next time for the next episode where you get more of the same and eventually we may resolve this and maybe we won't who knows <laughs> Yeah, soap operas, uh, they they are certainly an interesting phenomenon in that they are <laughs> pointless stories. That is, 
they don't there's no arc uh they're just a whole bunch of little arcs well <laughs> there is the the arc happens at the end of the season and whether it's a satisfying conclusion or not yes, it's yes. left up to your own interpretation because invariably it's going to be well guess what there's also another season coming next year yeah. or whenever the season restarts yeah yeah you know luke and laura luke falls off the the ship or some other shit like that and yeah oh yeah. what happened Where well is then he? does it so we really we're talking about multiple styles here uh you know the comp uh, the sequence of little arcs with a vague overarching arc uh oh what was it that there was a soap opera all my children or something like that yes there have been a couple of soap operas uh, initially many of the viewers were housewives at home who were getting older and so the primary protagonist was the old woman who's trying to wisely guide her children and her neighbors and her distant relatives and her in-laws and the milkman and so on um and basically the these other people provided the stories with the mother figure being the overarching factor but uh she never <laughs> in general she never aged uh the problem was the actresses yeah. aged so. like uh in general hospital there was the quarter mains and there was um they, Alan was one of the people that was over in the hospital or some other thing like that, but his parents are older and of course controlling. And um, I think it was Liza Corbin or something like that. I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I've dabbled down that rabbit hole, but yeah, you get the the very rich people and it's, it's never about, you know, the, the people who have no money, it's people who have money in some way and can do things yeah. with that. But totally. Yeah. Like that there are lots of these different structures and yeah. i think that what we're looking at is sort of like uh what in evolution is called radiation that yeah. is you'll have one species you know you wipe out the dinosaurs and then you have a few mammals and they radiate out so we have uh you know rodents and uh uh otters and uh big bears and so forth they they radiate out to fill different ecological niches and it seems like we're seeing something similar taking place with storytelling whereas previously storytelling was pretty much a single species um i don't know interesting thought well and uh, even getting to something like interactive fiction. So I, I picked up the GitLab documentary just recently and we, we watched it all the way through. And it was fascinating to see an evolution in that sense of the early, you know, part, text parsers and the early ideas of what exactly, you know, you're basically going through a cave and it is colossal. Um, so, and then that turned into stuff like Zork <laughs> And Adventure International's entire catalog and 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 the stories that came out of Infocom. So, but it people started expecting a little bit more out of them. It's like, what else have you got in this media? Yep. And unfortunately, the answer for that tended to be Sierra online type games. That was a dead end. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it graphically. Yeah. That just didn't work. Mm-hmm. So, but the other the other branch was started by the early '90s. What was that guy in Massachusetts uh, who set up the? He had a nice tool for developing interactive fiction. I know there's Inform. That seems to be the one that was real that got really popular, and that's the one that I've dabbled with a bit. Chris, you can speak to that probably. This was. Yeah, actually, that was overtaken by uh, by, uh, uh, by the the public tools. Uh, so, the forum is free, also. Pardon? Is it the forum is free, also? But it's probably yeah. more popular. Um, Twine is these days, I think. Hmm. By the way, I'll 
but I'll mention that uh, I encountered my first uh, adventure or text adventure tool in 1979. Uh, I mean, that's how simple those earlier ones were. Uh, a guy named Rob Zdibble, and that name is spelled Z-D-Y-B-E-L. Uh, he, he threw together uh, an adventure generation tool in Atari BASIC. And it was actually pretty good. It was up to the standard of the time. Uh, uh, and then I'm sure that the Git Lamp mentioned the guy in Florida who, uh, oh, he had a tool. Um, was I think quite... there were several of them. Yeah, there was one for the Sinclair um, called the Quill, which I have a manual for, but I don't actually have the software for it. I mean, physically <laughs> have the software for it. Well, um, so obviously we need a tool for interactive storytelling and so there far, we go. <laughs> uh, and Storytron is definitely not that tool, uh, but maybe the encounter editor, um, and very variations on it. Uh, maybe we'll find something that works in that pile. So anyway, any last thoughts? Um, I guess I kind of wanted to say about your original structure thing that um, the bush or the palm tree aren't like, um, I mean, uh, they're not necessarily the um, only things. I think like you leave out the one that um, like Emily Short calls uh what is it? Uh, salience engine or um, storylets where it's kind of like episodic, but exactly which encounter plays next oh, every step. Interchangeable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess like in, it's either um, chosen mm -hmm. by the player or it's based on the variables of what happens next. Um, I don't see that as fundamentally different. I have seen some of the taxonomies of structures used in interactive fiction. And there's quite a rich taxonomy, but at the same time, I see them as rather like, like, uh, you know, a taxonomy of rodents. We're still all basically the same, but with lots and lots of variations. Um, the story lets is, is, is uh, rather distant from, uh, you know, more like a raccoon than the general rodents po uh, taxonomy. Um, I don't know. I don't, I have yet to see, I don't know. What's your impression? I, I don't have the feeling that Storylets really solved the problem or, you know, took off. What, what's your impression? Yeah, I mean, I feel like structurally they're kind of fundamentally different. Um, whether there's like the um, pre-written, I guess like pre-structured, whether it's one long stalk or a bunch of branches, it's always the same structure every time, whereas the story lets they can be like a much more mm -hmm. variable structure. Well, certainly the story that's uh, is nicely analogous to the new uh, or to operating systems for handling uh, their way of handling inputs, whereas the old way, old way was just polling. You know, you just every now and then let's stop and go out and see if he's done anything. And if he's done something, let's analyze it, parse it, whatever, and then respond as opposed to the uh what's the proper event based i think is what it's called pardon event based yeah event based stuff uh, story that's just sort of analogous to an event based approach and uh yeah i guess it's kind of like modular programming instead of imperative yeah 
Yeah. And uh, so that that speaks well of the story lit concept. It may be that we simply haven't gotten sophisticated enough with it yet. I mean, the early event based stuff on the Macintosh was admittedly kind of clumsy. Uh, it took a while, especially there were some speed problems and so forth. So I don't know. Yeah, like I'm hoping um, Sasha's sweep wave is like a good implementation. I haven't had the chance to um, go back and use it recently, but I like the changes that he that um, like adding to it recently. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the danger with all of these tools is that they become, since they're created by programmers, they feel like programming um and uh what we need is something that works for storytellers that that i think has been the continuing problem mm -hmm. and of course the other side of that problem is their absolute refusal to get technical the storytellers just will not know i want to make it easy simple uh and well, uh, they suffer Microsoft Word, so they're already technical in some way or other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah, Photoshop, I, too. I'm sorry? Photoshop also. Yes. Yes. So I am I, I'm definitely becoming a bitter old man with respect to user interfaces. Um, for some reason, the... the uh, the ideological passion of the 80s where it's got to be clean it's got to be simple good user interface user friendly uh that has really vanished uh you should never ever step foot in my parents lincoln uh car because the interface that's in there is i i suffer bad at user interfaces and this is horrifically bad Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, for some reason we have really something has been lost. Um, people are not screaming, you know, shoot the programmer uh, because the yeah. Uh, although, I'm reminded it, of the uh, the Palm OS where there was someone literally going around figuring out how many clicks it was to anything. Oh. And I'm sure that person has either retired or just fallen off the face of the earth because quite literally we need folks like that yes. that are just insufferably doing that. Yeah. Well, maybe that's maybe that's a new crusade. Maybe I should leave it back to <laughs> storytelling behind and become the bane of bad user interfaces. I actually have a, a section of my website. I love reading it. It's amazing. <laughs> every every some, bit of it. <laughs> yeah, there are some really bad uh, user interfaces out there, and they just keep multiplying. Um, I don't know. I haven't done any recent things because I'm just overwhelmed by, you know, it's hard to pick out any single example Uh because well, you, have, you have a new app into Apple Macintosh, so I'm sure there's uh, plenty of fodder there. Oh, yeah. What I've heard from other Apple folks, unfortunately, it feels like they've lost their way. Yes, definitely. Um, I don't know what went wrong. Maybe it was after Steve Jobs died. Um, mm -hmm. well, I'm still trying to get <laughs> on my iPhone. I'll show you. Uh, okay, wait, here we go. Um, here is a cute little cartoon diagram here. Uh, the, the beaver there has a maple leaf on his T-shirt. And uh, <laughs> it represents Canadians' view of the U.S. But you'll notice it's in the wrong. This is in uh, landscape layout, but it's being shown portrait. No problem. You just rotate the i. Uh, uh oh, you're supposed to rotate the iPhone and it'll it'll shift, but it doesn't. Why? Because the iPhone has this little secret place where you can you can set it to permit uh, that that rotation. 
only to get it, you have to place your, I think one or, I'm not sure whether it's one or two fingers at a particular pixel. I mean, it's a little line about two pixels wide and then pull up and no, that didn't do it. I, I rue the day that people decided all of a sudden to do two, three, four finger gestures. So I have a, I have an Android phone because I'm weird that way. And it's trying to tell me, it has this thing about, oh, I can use all these gestures. And I'm like, I do not have the mental bandwidth. I am at that age now where yeah. double click was, was enough. Right click was fine. Middle click. Yes. If you're on a Unix system. I don't have the bandwidth for three fingers thrown in in this direction <laughs> yeah. or this other direction. That's just a bridge too far. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, maybe I should be Pardon? Um, two fingers scrolling is nice on a touchpad on the laptop, but that's all I use. Yeah, same here. So, well, maybe I should form a terrorist society that... Uh, of people angry about bad user. I, I will co-sign that first day, <laughs> day one on there. Okay, well, I'm going to think about this, about what can, about there, because it really is, it has reached avalanche proportions. So with that in mind, uh, thanks for your comments. And uh, I'll see you guys next month. Sounds uh, like a presumably plan. you'll see a lot more people who, when they finally got their clock set right so that's what i'm hoping take care all thanks uh, okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.